All right, I, I, I do, do have some presumed, presumed knowledge for this presentation. presentation. You, know you know how basic SSH, SSH usage, usage, you know what SSH, SSH is, what it, is, what it does. Um, you know, know the file system permissions required by SSH. SSH. So, so when, we talk, when, when I talk about uh, you know no host file, you can config, you can, you can figure out those permissions on your own. I'm not going to get into them. Uh, and then also basic SSH uh, key and fingerprint usage. Uh, if you have questions about those, um, look at the man page, look at lots of documentation online, uh, read my uh, Linux journal article, I'm pretty certain I, I specify those in there, or ask on the plug mailing list. We've got lots of options for that. All right. Uh, so SSH, uh, secure shell. So this is a way of securely connecting from one machine to another machine. Uh, in the beginning, there was Telnet. So you, so you can tell that from one machine, machine with, to, 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 you know, go say, hey, hey, let me connect to this other computer, and, and tell that had no security on it, no encryption. Uh, when you typed your password, anybody that was on the network could read your, your password, uh, especially back, back, in, the back in the day with their broadcast, broadcast networks. networks. So, so anybody, anybody on the network could read your password. Um, and then, of course, they could read all the data that went back and forth. Uh, and then we came up with RSH where, you know, you could, you could log in automatically and do stuff, but it was still unencrypted. Uh, and this guy in Finland said, hey, I've got time this weekend. I'll create this encrypted version of it. we got SSH. Uh, and then uh, there were some things that happened back and forth. And then eventually uh, uh, OpenBSD, uh, for Ed, who has now walked out, uh, went through and created the uh, OpenSSH uh, project, uh, which is pretty well the SSH that most of us use. Um, and that allows us to securely connect from one machine to another machine. Our, when, when we, we use the pass, when we use, use a password to authenticate, that's, that's encrypted. We can also use a key, so, so you, you don't have to enable password authentication, which, which is the way I recommend it. Um, and then, of course, the data can be encrypted as well. You, you can send the, the data in, in an unencrypted, unencrypted format if you need because of bandwidth uh, limitations or something like that. Uh, but you, you actually have to go out of your way a little bit in order to do that. Uh, and, of course, I recommend against it. Uh, I, I actually recommend, recommend using SSH, SSH everywhere. everywhere. I, I use, use it on my internal network at home. I, of, of course, use it for everything I do for work. Um, and, and, of course, anytime you're, you're stepping across the internet, I uh, do that. that. Uh, the, my uh, Linux journal article is about crossing a comp known to be compromised host or suspected compromised host where I need to log into one host that I don't trust to get to another host behind it. And how can I do that? Securely, so, so that, that I can get to host C without compromising that connection. And I'll cover that in a second when we get to tunnels. Um, but, but that's basically what, what I do is create a tunnel, and then, then you can, can from, from from your desktop, host A, from your laptop, desktop, you, you can verify the connection to host C because you're still connecting to that SSH daemon. They, they can't man in the middle of that if, if you've set up your your, your key authentication properly. properly. And really, if you think about it. Anytime you connect on the internet, that's what you're doing. Because that untrusted host is the routers. It's your ISP. The particular case I was using, uh, this was when I was working at a company where I didn't want to be very flagrant about what I was doing because it would have been politically problematic. Uh, and we would have had to call the CEO who would have backed me, but you know, I'd rather not have to do that. Um, actually, his secretary would have fixed it all, which was awesome. Um, but uh, we, we were supposed to log into a jump post, and, and then from that jump post, we could connect to our internal boxes. But the problem is I was looking at data that the people who ran that jump post were not allowed to look at. I was looking at student data. There is federal laws that says that I can't give those people access. So I needed to securely go across that jump post without them being able to see it. So from my perspective, that jump post was compromised. Because it had people who had root on that machine that were, were not allowed to be able to look at the data that, that I was moving back and forth across that machine. So, yes, yes it wasn't broken into or hacked, but, but I still had to protect, protect my data from, from the people who owned the machine who were, who were running the SSH daemon on that machine. And, and so, uh, this is the mechanism I described there, uh, using a tunnel across a tunnel, uh, allowed me to have that, that secure and known secure SSH connection. Um, and, and move data back and forth, even, even though I was going against what, from my perspective, was a compromised machine. Uh, had, had it really been compromised, of course, yes, the real, real responsibility was to take the machine out of service, fix it, it or, or put some, some other machine in place, which, which we also had to do when I was at the company, but that was a different thing. All right, so it allows an encrypted connections to other computers, allows passing data across the encrypted connections. Uh, it does require an account on the remote computer, so you've got to have accounts on the other machines. Uh, in order to, to use to, to use to take advantage of the security connection. connection. So, so basic, basic tunnel. 
uh, dash capital L says local tunnel. So the first part is a port number. Uh, now, why is that port number above 1023? I shouldn't be running as root anyway. Uh, so the first 1024 ports, so 0 to 1023, are reserved for root. So that's, for instance, you can't, as a normal user, just stand up a web server on port 80 or set up a DNS server on port 53. Uh, TCP anyways, um, because those ports are reserved for root. So I want to make sure I'm, I get a uh, port number above that. So I just chose 2222 because 22 22 22 22 22 22 22 22 22 is the port for SSH. So I said, let's create a local tunnel, 2222 on my machine, to um, firewall.example.com port 22. So the SSH service on the firewall. And then, and then the last part is the machine I'm connecting to in order to create the tunnel. So, so I am creating a connection to the firewall that's on port 22, and then over that I'm tunneling from port 22, 22 on my machine to port 22 on the firewall. That seems kind of funny because I'm already connecting over the firewall, right? But now you can do things like um, reuse connections, use different keys, um, and, and so forth. Um, even, even across that, that one firewall. So now I've got one connection, and then anybody that's sniffing my, tra my traffic will just see that one connection. And then I can throw a whole bunch of things across there, and they, they can't see what it is I'm tossing in there. If I'm throwing in some graphics, if I'm throwing in a bunch of text, if I figured out a way to port a camel across an SSH tunnel, they can't see. Now they can see the, the content. If the camel hasn't had any water for a couple weeks, it's less content. If it's just Drunk up, but there's a lot of content. Same, Same thing if I'm doing video, it's going to be a lot of content. Uh, if I'm copying you know, half of the uh, secure archives from the NSA, there's going to be a lot of content because uh, they're looking at everything we do. So um, you know, they can see the amount of content, but they can't see what type of content. And even though I'm using multiple tunnels, they can't even see how many connections I have because they're all going across that main tunnel. Uh, and then when, we, when, when I get to keys, I will try to remember to cover another example. Now, now, the other thing is, this is not too terribly useful. useful. It's still useful. I, I like it. I use it. But we can do other things with that. Um, so uh, this is a nice graphic that Brian created for me back when, uh, because you can tell I didn't create it because, one, it's legible, uh, and two, it's pretty. So it's got stuff in there. All right, so you have your machine uh, that you're connecting from. The SSH tunnel, and I usually have props and stuff, but since this is the last minute thing, I don't really have props. So your SSH tunnel is the dotted line, and that's the outside, uh, and then you've got your, your tunnel connection inside of that, uh, and uh, an SSH connection inside that tunnel connection. We will get to the forwarded connection and the SSH connection in a second, but notice that the forwarded connection from the gateway to the machine you're trying to reach is red for danger, right? Uh, sorry, you're not going to make it through uh, the general people in red. If, you're, if this was Star Trek, you're not going to make it through the episode, right? Unless you're Scottish. Um, but anyways, the red thing is, is dangerous. That portion of the, of the connection is not encrypted. So if I use an unencrypted service across that portion of the tunnel, then that portion is unencrypted. If I don't trust the people that own the gateway, that means they can sniff it because they can sniff it as it leaves the gateway, right? They can see that I'm connecting to that internal machine. But if, if I, I use an encrypted connection, an encrypted service across that thrown portion of the tunnel, they, they can't see what's inside the encrypted connection. connection. That's the goal of it. Um, so uh, that's, that's why I've got to use SSH. I'm using SSH in my examples, so I have an encrypted connection directly from my machine to the machine I'm trying to reach. That, in, that SSH connection that's blue going across both of those pieces of the tunnel is an ACK sent from my machine that, that is received by the machine I'm trying to reach, untouched by gateway, goes across that tunnel. Knack, hack, you, know, you get the full three-way three handshake. And then I have an SSH connection. Again, I'm talking directly from my client on my machine to the machine I'm trying to reach. Across the tunnel, the gateway doesn't know it. It just sees data going back and forth. Right? Now, they can close my connection anytime they want because they can just cut off all my data. But they can't see what it is as long as I'm making sure that I'm encrypting, uh, encrypting that. Uh, it also means that the data from my machine to the, to the machine you're, I'm trying to reach, the, the, the part of it that's going to the gateway is double encrypted. So you've got SSH inside of SSH. Uh, I've talked to a whole bunch of people from that do 
security way better than me. None of them will be able to come up with a case where that's actually better or worse. I think it's slightly less secure, but I'm not that knowledgeable of a person for, for that, the, the mathematics involved, let's say. All right. Uh, so throwing the connection. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm uh, um, oh, oh, that was, that was I forgot the, the header up top here. So the, the header shows the SSH dash, dash P tells me what port to connect to. So the 2222 22 that was created in the previous slide. Uh, and, and then I'm connecting to localhost. Local that's a key. I do not, not need to even know from my machine the name, name of the machine I'm trying to reach. Right? Or my, my machine doesn't need to know. I need to know to set up the tunnel. But my machine doesn't need to know how to get there. I can use a DNS entry that my machine can't resolve. Um, but when, when I talk, talk then, I'm talking, talking to that local port that, that I created, 2222, on my machine. So the local host are 127001, and so forth. All right. Yes. yes. I think probably uh, useful to point out that you've got that other tunnel running in a different shell. Yes. yes. And so you didn't stop that, and this is, this is running in addition to it using the tunnel that yeah. you created. Uh, good, good point. point. So the, the initial tunnel that I created is a simple tunnel, and that, that shell is, is, a, is a live shell with, with giving me a prompt on the, fi on the firewall. So, so I did not cancel it. There are ways to tell SSH create a connection and then give me my shell back. I did not take advantage of those in this particular example. Uh, so good point, Mitch, that, that this is a, I have two different X terms or two different windows and screen or whatever, key box or whatever, in order to do this, this type of connection. Um, that, that works, works for me because I'm usually wanting to create a dozen or more connections every time I do connect that port. port. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. fine. I, I, I just do that. Um, now, now, oh, and, and an important part is if I have that shell and, and do something, something on the gateway, type ls, have files, ssh to the machine I'm trying to reach, from the gateway, now, now whoever owns the gateway can read that data because they, they can give me a compromised SSH plan. plan. Right? But, but even if they, they give me a compromised SSH daemon, if, if I've set, set up my certificates, certificates right, they, they cannot compromise my connection. They, they can make it to where I can't connect. They own the machine. There's lots, lots of ways they can do that. that. They, they can't, can't compromise, compromise that connection. All right. So, so this example of throwing, throwing the connection, I'm using uh, some, some of the other, other options. I, I, as, as I said, I did this last couple of years ago. I don't remember what they are. But I think the N and the F are helping me to do what I just mentioned in response to Mitch, is that I drop that initial shell, so I don't end up keeping a shell at the gateway. I don't accidentally start typing secret data in there and giving it away to our, our uh, security admin. All right, um, so I am connecting. Um, but in this case, I'm saying connect to server.example.com. Now, example.com is not allowed on the internet. It's a fake thing. So if I'm using that for work internally, then I will not be able to resolve that from my machine home. But, but as long as, as Gateway, Gateway can resolve it, I can connect. connect. I'm, I'm throwing the connection uh, from port 8000 on my local machine to port 80 on server.example.com across the firewall uh, that I've handly, uh, uh, that I've luckily labeled as Gateway in the drawing. Because, you know, Brian did that, and I was just did, did not update my test with my fault. All right, so, so I've, I've got that port going, going across, but again, again port 80. Port 80 is not encrypted. So, so now when I make that connection across there, I'm making an unencrypted connection, web connection, from the gateway, gateway to the web, web server. Right? So, so anything I do across that is not encrypted. But if, if that, that web server is only available on the inside network, I can, I can use it. I can, I can get, get my machine to pull up web pages off that web server and interact with it across the tunnel. So, so this is an example, I say that SSH is the original, original VPN because it was the, the, connect, the thing that allowed us to have a secure connection and allowed us to have tunnels where I could throw different data across there. Now the, the difference between SSH as a VPN as I use it and what most people think of as a VPN uh, connection is that a VPN, somebody else sets up all the secrets to make sure that you can connect to all the things you're supposed to connect to. Oftentimes, just by saying everything goes across the VPN, which, which is really a hard type of thing to do, but that's, that's what usually what they do. Um, but, but the other thing that they can do is they can configure it and say, well, everything that's for example.com and myexample.com and, and the parent company.com 
will go across, across the tunnel and everything else doesn't. Or they, they can say, um, YouTube, YouTube doesn't go across the tunnel because doing video across the tunnel is just killing the bandwidth, but everything else goes across the tunnel, right? So they can do things like that. With, with SSH, SSH, I'm in charge of configuration. I set those things up. <laughs> it, it takes me a couple minutes or you know, a, 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 you know, part of an hour when I get a new job and when, when I find out about new domains I need to do, but I get there. The nice thing about the way I do it is that when it's a VPN, and most places I worked at, they don't keep their VPN lists update. So, so I end, end up with parts of the, the company, company I can't get to until I set up my SSH tunnel. Like, forget, forget it, I'll fix it. You know? So this, this gives me a way of fixing it on my own unless I have to provide documentation for somebody else's company. company. And then, then I have to wait for, for uh, InfoSec or not to fix their stuff. stuff. All right. I've already said, said multiple times, careful of that unencrypted leg. I will keep saying that for years and years to come. All right. Now, SOS. Uh, these, these are, are a good, good way to keep, keep our feet warm in the Phoenix desert. desert. It gets, gets kind of cold, you know, here during the day. Um, but, but SOX is a type of uh, a tunnel that we can use. There are certain services that understand it, web being one of those. And this allows your, your uh, connection to be encrypted without having to make a, um, a, a, a tunnel for each and every web server that you want to talk to. So basically what I do is I set up the dash capital B that says this will be my SOX uh, uh, tunnel and the port I want to use. Uh, and then I connect up. And now I can configure my browser using Foxy Proxy or some other proxy uh, uh, service to say that um, for these domains, for mycompany.com, myparentcompany.com, and childcompany.com, and whatever else, um, that, that when, when I connect to those things, my browser, browser will then use port 1080 on my, my local machine to make, make that connection. Now, now those connections will go across the tunnel and be coming as a client from firewall.example.com. So, so if the firewall has access to my internal domains, my, the internal only web servers, I can use that tunnel in order to get there. Um, I just used this recently to save myself because when I was updating um, some uh, 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 CentOS machines that, that did not have internet, internet access. But, but I had mandatory security updates that, that security was, main, man, was demanding that I install using the access, access they would give me. And I was like, well, I can't get those from here. I could, I could have copied things, things over and I did a little bit of that, that but, but there was a couple things that I couldn't actually do that for for, for strange reasons. So, so what I did is I, I set up a proxy server on my, on my machine, machine, and then, then I set up a tunnel, a uh, uh, SOX tunnel, from, from the machines I was updating back to my proxy server, and then, then told Yum, hey, hey, go, go use this proxy. And, and the updates happened. Uh, and, and then the nice thing about that as well is because, because I needed to do this live for a couple of reasons. reasons. Um, because I was, I was providing a proxy, basically the first batch of 60 gigs worth of, of packages took, took a while, while to get to my machine, and then my machine, machine cached it all. So, so I said, like, okay, the rest of it was on the local network. network. Well, our, our internal network was across the continent, continent but still. Um, so, so that much went much quicker. quicker. That's, That's the, the other thing about SSH, it's fan line. line. I can do toss tunnels in any direction from anywhere that I've got a shell. shell. All I have to be able to do is get SSH from one box to another box. As long as I can do that, I can get there. And even if I can't do that, I'll cover how to cheat. All right, so, so the first part of cheating is you need to know how to go in reverse. Um, so, so the reverse, the dash L, if you remember, was from my local host. So the dash L8080 was creating its support from the local host 8080 to port 80 on that web server. The dash R says, when you connect to that remote machine, now create a tunnel from there back to the machine I'm on. So the dash R2112 says, on uh, uh, firewall.example.com, when I connect, create the port 2112 connection, and that, that is talking to the SSH, SSH server, server on my machine. machine. So, so now I can connect from the firewall back to my machine, machine over SSH, SSH using a client connection from that side. Right? Uh, and, and then I can use the, the local ports uh, to create um, a connection from another host on port 3113 
that goes from local, local host on host 2 to the firewall and connects to port 2112 on the firewall. So what does that connect to? It connects to the tunnel that's talking to my web server, or to my SSH server. So now, now I've got these two machines talking on the firewall, but, I, but since, since I will be SSHing from host 2, talking to the SSH server on my machine, I still have a secure connection because as long as I make sure that connection is secure through a normal SSH mechanism, if you're not doing that, you should, you're not using SSH, right? As long as I do that, I'm still good. Now, where is this useful? Well, if both machines are behind a NAT, or other, other ways where you can't SSH, SSH in, in, now, now I, can I can do a third-party third connection. So, so I can do that, that through the firewall at work, or, or if I can SSH through a third-party third party service, things like that. that. Now, now if, if you're doing this at work, work, be careful because, because you know they have rules and things and you like, like to stay employed and stuff like that. that. So obviously, obviously be careful about what you're doing that, that it meets your requirements for work. But there are lots of other places I've been, like hotels and stuff like that, that don't allow me to have SSH connections back when I didn't have uh, uh, when, when I had that at home through my IST, I, I needed, needed a way to be able to get back into the, to the house so I could do things like check my mail, mail, because I run my own mail server. So, so using that through a third-party third party service, I was, I was able, able to do that, that, and I didn't have to trust the third-party service. Because again, again, I'm connecting from client to server, and I own both parts, and I'm verifying the keys and make sure everything's correct. Now the double reverse, I don't remember, and I'm tired, so we're going to read this at home. Uh, the simplified, simplified double reverse, uh, same thing. Actually, actually I think I covered. Oh, what, what I'm doing there is um, I see what I'm doing. Uh, so, so I created, created that reverse tunnel from my machine at home and from the work machine internally. Both of them have listening connections on the firewall. So now, now I can go either direction directly from uh, the, the machine from, from each of the machines, even if the firewall isn't routing to either machine. Right, so, so if they're both behind the NAT, I can connect to that third-party service that I've got a shell at, and, and, and I can get it in. So that's, that's the, the uh, double NAT type of thing. And network, network address table, uh, for those of you that don't remember, remember. Um, that's so, so if you don't have a uh, connection that allows you to SSH into your system or to have um, uh, services running on it, uh, you can, that, that's part of what a NAT is. It, it gives you a... a um, non-public IP address or a slew of them behind a public IP address so you can't really route across it. Uh, when, when we all move to IPv6, sometime in the next 500 years, uh, that will go away because by IPv6 you get a billion addresses. Uh, but in the meantime, we still have to deal with it. Uh, the simplified version. All right, keys. So you're using keys is fairly easy. SSH-keygen, give it a file name. Uh, that, that file should be in most, most likely in your .sh directory, your home directory. Um, I, I recommend that the default is ID something, something, whatever. I recommend sticking with that ID dash. So when, when you create a bunch of keys, which, which if you've listened, listened to me over the years, you should be creating lots of keys um, because you shouldn't use the same key for multiple services. Um, when, when I was working as a consultant and I would have multiple clients, I didn't use the same key for any two clients. That way if a key got compromised, because, because of something in a client, I didn't, didn't have to worry about, about other clients being compromised. Right? Different, different password for every service. I've said that, that at every presentation I've given in the last five years, I think. Uh, so, so same, same thing. thing, different key for each service. service. If, if I'm, I'm creating keys for plug, and I'm creating keys for scale, and I'm creating keys for the new job, and for the old job, they will all be different keys. Um, and and it does require me to, to, to learn more passphrases or to use a password manager. I do both. Um, but uh, it's still better than uh, having one key to rule them all, right? You don't want one key to get compromised and be able to uh, compromise everything in your life. Uh, authorized keys. Um, so you create that new key, but you need to put it on the remote machine. Uh, you can copy that over by yourself, or there's a shell script called ssh-copy-id that will do it for you. You authenticate the first time with ssh-copy-id. Say, copy this key to that machine, you authenticate, it copies, it copies it over. Now, now you can use your key to, to connect across. Right? Uh, and, and then this is a really useful feature that I, uh, uh, this is one of the things I want to put in the, the newer SSH or expand on in the newer SSH uh, uh, presentation. 
the, the command equal. So inside your SSH configuration file, or not, excuse me, in, 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 not in the configuration file, in, in the authorized keys file, on, on that remote machine, before the key, you look, look at the man page for, for syntax and stuff, you, you can, can do command equals. And when, when you, you do a command equals, that command, whatever you put in there, in this case ID, say tell me who I am, is, is what will be run. run. It doesn't matter what the SSH client says to run. If the SSH client says, hey, break, break into the NSA for me, that, that machine is not going to do that unless ID breaks into the NSA. NSA. And then you get some other issues going on. Right? So, so it, it will run whatever you're doing. doing. So, so if you, you have to need a passwordless connection for some reason, like, like for backups, you, you can use the command equals to go through and say, this key is only allowed to run my backups. As long as, long as you can distill, distill those down to a single, single sane command. command. There's, There's actually, actually ways to get around that that are beyond the scope of this particular, particular presentation. It will be in the, in the next one. Um, but, but this, this is, is really good, good especially for a place like, like say, where you need to have passwordless keys, so there's, there's no authentication whatsoever. You don't, don't want those keys laying around for people to be able to use and do willy-nilly things with them. You don't, don't want them to be able to use get a shell. This, this says you can only do this one thing. And more of those things you can have it do is sudo. What does sudo do? It allows, allows you to switch, switch users. users. So, so I, I believe it allows you to uh, make commands as the root. As, as root or as anybody, anybody else, right? right? So, so I, I have, have a backup, backup service running as Fred, Fred because, because that just makes sense, right? So I have, I have a backup, backup service running as Fred. Fred. I can connect as me, sudo to Fred, Fred to do whatever, whatever it is that I need to do. do. Or, or more likely what I really need to do, because if I'm backing up, I can just connect to me back. My file should be able to back up, right? But Maybe, Maybe I've got, got an SS, uh, a MySQL server, server running, and, and I need to be able to kick off a um, uh, something to do to, 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 to back up the MySQL server properly. So, so I can set up a sudo MySQL, you know, dump your, dump your, dump your stuff, you know, backup thing, whatever. So, so I can then connect as me, not, not need to know the MySQL password, password but, but still be able to sudo, and only be able to sudo using this command. Of course, of course if I lock down my sudo permission, then, then I have also chained, you know, locked down what, what can, can be done, done across that. that. So, so I can use this to doubly not need to run as root, not need to run as escalated privileges. You, you should, should not allow uh, SSH, SSH as, as root from one machine to another machine, machine. period. Right? Right? The high performance cluster guys doing some amazing, amazing things and, and moving trillions of bits of data every second, okay, they, they get, get a different thing, thing. they're inside of a glass bubble uh, that hopefully is secure to be with. But, but for, for the, the rest, rest of us, uh, uh, you know, on, in, especially in production, do not, not allow root to log, log in the SSH. SSH. Make, Make people log in as themselves or as some, some, some service if they need to, and then use sudo to, to acquire the privileges they need to. And in a lot of cases, you don't need to require root. You don't need to acquire root anyway. You need to acquire a service that allows you to restart HTTP. You need a service, you know, something that will allow you to restart services or do do some particular task. You don't, don't need to be able, able to get, get, get to the root in order to do that. All right, so, so here's, here's an example of how to do some, some other, other services, or uh, a, 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 a different service, in this case, uh, email. So, so I am uh, creating a local uh, uh, tunnel on port 2143 on my local machine. I am connecting, connecting up to firewall.example.com again. And I am then throwing a tunnel so imap.example.com, imap is a, a protocol for checking your mail, and, and that runs on port 143. Uh, and actually nowadays I think I should be doing 90, 90, yeah, 993 I get after that for the secure connection. connection. Um, oh, no. PLS, PLS moved back to 193? Port 43 I mean? I think. Anyway, go, go look at the current docs. Don't read my 15 year old example. Alright, um, but anyway, so I'm throwing a tunnel from my local machine on 2143 to, one, to, the to the IMAP, IMAP service, service, and then 2993 to the secure IMAP, IMAP service. As, as I say, I think that's changed now with PLS, but back in the day when I wrote this, this was proper. Then, then also, also from 2025 to SMTP on the SMTP server at example.com, uh, should I ever you know, start a company called example.com. Um, and now, on my local machine, I can, I can start, start my mail, mail client, client, whatever that is, Alpine, uh, Evolution, whatever, K-Mail, and then I, say, I can say connect to my local host, and those connections are secure over SSH. Right? 
So I, again, I have a secure connection. And, and I don't have to muck with the TLS and other things that might or might not be in place. Say, I've worked, worked in a lot of places that aren't, aren't using, if they're, they're using, using Gmail, that fixes it because Google will take care of those things. But if they're, they're using their own mail service, uh, I've worked, worked in a lot of places that don't set up security properly for secondary services like mail. Well, well now, now at least my portion of the connection is secure, whatever they're, they're doing, and, and I can connect from wherever. wherever right? uh, uh, web, uh, covered, covered that before, 8080 for, for regular web, 8443 in this example for uh, uh, HTTPS. Uh, the, the, um, the SOX, SOX proxy I covered earlier. Uh, this, this is the point where before, before when I was like prepared and doing things, I would, I would flip, flip over to a web browser and show you proxy proxy. proxy uh, and at scale, when I was doing that, Randall Cunningham was in the, was in the, was in the uh, uh, Schwartz was in the front row, so I rewrote my, present, my, my example to use regular, regular expressions because that's the thing he does uh, on the fly and it worked out well. So it was good. So, so awesome, presenta uh, awesome example, you're not going to see, sorry. Um, uh, that scale presentation is online, you can go look at it there. Uh, some, some extra stuff. stuff. All right, so, so I can SSH to a uh, machine. Uh, and, and I, I didn't, didn't cover this, I should have, but, but I SSH connect to a machine, machine and, and it runs by default whatever your default shell, shell is. So, so most Linux, Linux servers, servers nowadays will be bin bash, so you do the bash shell. Um, but, but you, you could make your local, your, your default shell for that account, BID, or time, uh, or restarting your NTP service, whatever you want to make the default shell. Um, and, and that's what, the, what, what will happen when you log in. But I, I can also say, here's, here's a command, command to run, and then run, run that command instead. So in this case, I'm SSHing to the firewall again. And, and I'm saying, instead of starting a shell, I'm going to sudo, in this case, I'm not giving a user, so I'm sudoing the root, tar, create a tarball from a Vetsy, so I'm making a backup of my configuration files. And uh, the dash has to it to, 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 to scan it out. And then, then I throw that into a pipe that, that is back to my local machine across that SSH tunnel. tunnel. And then I'm saying, well, OK, now, now go through and um, uh, expand, expand that tarball into temp. temp. So, so I'm, I'm making a copy of Etsy back on temp in my, on my, my local machine. machine. Um, now, now granted, granted I, you know, you know, I'm backing up the firewall of Etsy. Uh, now, now, if, if you, you go, go to my other presentation, you should learn you, you should, should use Etsy, you should be using Etsy Keeper, and then you should just do a git run instead. But, but you know, if you, you haven't gotten there, do this, this for backups, backups until you get, you know, and then go to install Etsy Keeper and fix it. All right. Um, the next, next example, I'm SSHing the firewall again, and, and I'm asking for a process list, yes, AUXW, and I'm piping that back across that tunnel to T on my machine. So why am I using T? What does T do? So it, so it takes standard in and splits it into two. It puts it in a file and it puts it in standard out. So one of the examples where this is really, really useful is there are plenty of times when you can get a server just so busy that you can't actually get a shell on the box. But you can SSH to it. So you can't get the shell once you SSH to it, but if you give it a command, it'll run the command. Or if it takes a while, instead, instead of waiting for the shell, and then, then typing PS, uh, space, uh, or, or copying and pasting, right? right? And you're, you're waiting for it, you're waiting for the, the output to come back. back. We're, we're just skipping the TTY. We're skipping, skipping anything that's locked on the TTY. Uh, with TTY, TTY being, being the local terminal, that you, pseudo terminal that you're using. And then I'm saying, just give me the data, put it on my local machine. I've got a copy of it in the file. I can look at it as it comes in. But, but then, then if I, I go do a couple things, things, I can go look at the file again. I can go, go grab, grab and, and find, find out you know, how, many, how much resources am I still using. How many shells did that, that new system in spawn on my, my machine to lock up all my resources, right? Um, you know, so, you so you can do things like that on your local machine instead of on the machine that's resource constrained. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of things you can run uh, this, this way as well, including if, you know, if your MySQL server has gone, gone uh, uh, berserk, you, you can, can do a service my SQL restart, or however you're doing, my SQL restarts, restarts on your box, right? Or just kill it, and then, then restart it after that. that. All right, I, I can use SCP, which, which says copy this data from this machine to that machine. I can go, go either direction, direction. copy from localhost to the remote machine, from the remote machine back to the localhost. I think actually right now you can copy from 
one, one remote host to another, another remote host across your machine without ever putting it on your machine, which, which is, you know, that that was, that's kind of cool. I don't need it anymore, but back in the day, that would have been awesome. Uh, so that I did a whole bunch of pipes and tars. Um, so uh, you, can, you can do that. Uh, it will allow you to do it recursively. Uh, there's a couple of different options for SCP. Um, uh, but that means I don't have to use the pseudo tar uh, so much. I still might use, need to use the pseudo tar if I need to change users. Because SCP, you would need to connect to whatever user you want. Uh, so I can SCP as root to the firewall and back up SCP. But of course, you should never, ever allow that. Especially on your firewall. Not on your firewall. Not, not on the externally facing servers. Please, please no. All right. SFTP is an FTP service uh, over SSH. So for people that are use it, that are useful, used to FTP, it basically gives you a shell on the other machine so you can CD around and dawdle and look at things. And if they've got graphical clients, you can clicky clicky and stuff like that. Um, if you're into that, use SFTP. But you know, I'm a system so I'm going to use SFTP. Uh, and SFTP is not necessarily turned on on that, that remote machine. Uh, another example is I can use a third-party service and say, tell that service to set up an SSH tunnel. So in this case, rsync is a, is a uh, uh, very nice protocol for going through and copying only the differences from one machine to another machine or from one place to another place. So I'm saying use rsync, but I'm saying for the shell, that dash E says to use SSH for my connection. Which, which is, is actually, actually the default now. It hasn't always, always been. And then, then the rest of our RSH, our, our uh, uh options to copy, copy that data from one machine to another machine. Uh, and, and then, then resources, uh, openssh.com. Uh, I'm not going to plug there very much because Ed was out of the room, room when I did earlier. earlier. Sorry, you missed it, man. I said nice things about OpenBSD. Did you miss it? Um, you'll have to watch the video. Um, my article that I wrote for Linux Journal, uh, this was in 2010. Uh, it's it's been a while, but the information in that article is still, is still accurate. Um, the, the formatting that they put on the web was not so great. Um, I can't remember if I fixed it on my website, uh, but you can start there. Uh, and then uh, there are a whole bunch of OpenSSH manuals. Uh, this is one that, I, that was really good several years ago. I don't know if it still is or if there are better things. Uh, I should mention the OpenSSH uh, IRC channel as well. Uh, which, which has been, been uh, very useful. Lots, lots of really knowledgeable people on there. there. People that understand security. They're concerned about security. Uh, they are quite familiar with OpenSSH. Open I have been able to, to stump them a couple times, but, but for the most part, uh, it's, it's a really handy group uh, for learning more about uh, security detection and stuff. All right. Any questions? Yes. Um, when you were talking about high per, uh, those that are performing high performance clustering, you were saying that they should have more leeway when it comes to privileges or something? Well, what, what I was, I was saying, saying, so high performance clusters are basically, it's like so physicists use this. And they will use this super machine. You know, when you see the list of like the 100 fastest machines in the world, those are the HPCs. And, and physicists, physicists are using this machine, machine with 10,000 CPUs to model the, the first three seconds of a nuclear explosion, or the, the, the first microseconds, or pro actually probably, probably less than a nanosecond of the, the Big Bang, right? And they are, I know, I know of a couple people who are literally creating terabyte scratch files for, for, for data you know, that, they're, that, they're, that they're working on, and then, then they throw it away, because they don't actually have a way of storing the data, data that they're creating for a test. test. It's, it's just cheaper to go recreate the whole test than to try to save the data back. Um, but, but with that, you have a lot of interconnects because you've got you know, 10,000 CPUs. They're not all in one machine. They're in a whole bunch of different machines. But what, what you should have is you should have that cluster in a segmented network that is protected in, in 14 different ways so that people can't get into it. And you know, Russia can't go, hey, let's figure out how to crack into all the full of parties mail, mail servers using, using this HPC. HPC you know? um, so, so you've got, uh, in, in, in that, that case, they're slinging tons and tons of data in, I work, I work in a place now that has petabytes of, of data. And they're, they're slinging data in, in things that are beyond my concept of how much data they're moving in some, some of these cases. Um, so, so using SSH, using a secure connection, connection to sling that data back and forth, slows them down a lot. Uh, so in that particular case, for those, those local jobs, machines talking to each other, they've, they've actually got a pretty good reason to not use SSH. 
for, for the, the rest of us that don't, don't have multi-million dollar machines, even, even if, if we have multi-million dollar infrastructures, for the rest of us, we should, should use SSH everywhere. everywhere. Right. I'm, I'm certain, certain Google's got some other things because like they're slinging lots of data as well, but, but I actually bet for their, their internal network, network nowadays, it's, it's encrypted. Uh, in fact, if you look at initiatives from Google and Facebook and a couple of the other big time uh, tech companies that, are, that have a lot of personal data, they're, they're trying, trying to make it to where you can't read the data even if you're in the data center. So you, you walk, walk in the data center and walk out, Google does, does a truckload of servers at a time, and, and you somehow shove that on your back and walk out with a truckload of, of servers. All of that data is encrypted at rest when, when it, it transits at all places at all times, and you, you cannot actually get that data unencrypted unless, unless you figure out a way to break the encryption. Um, so, so uh, they're, they're probably, probably not using SSH, they're, they're using some other stuff, but uh, for the rest of us, if you're, you're making connections as a system man or as a normal user, user like, like I said, even, even on your local, local network, network, use SSH. It, it doesn't, doesn't slow things down, down that much. much. You're really not seeing data around, around that much. much. Uh, and, and, it, and staying encrypted is good. That, that way, if one, one machine gets compromised, they, they can't use it to just go around and start sucking up your data every well. The other thing, of course, is make sure you install your security up so it's less likely that they broke it. All right, uh, Paul, you had a question, question or you had his question? Yeah, I had a, a question on the command reports. Yes. yes. You, mentioned, you specify over there, you know, the command is allowed to run mm -hmm. after the authentication happens. Yes. Okay. So, so it's, whatever, whatever you put, put in there, there is, is it, that's the only thing that's allowed to run. It's, it's, it's hard coded, coded so you can't use, you, you can't use like regular, regular expressions or lobbying to do things. You, you can't, can't list a bunch of commands. commands. And, and select, select from them, them it, it says run this. If you need to select a bunch of commands, commands basically you need to write a wrapper that gives you a menu to select your commands, commands right? So, so this goes through and um, uh, says, says whatever, whatever this command, command is, ignore what the client requested. requested. I, don't I don't care what they said, said throw it away, and run, run this command. command. Now, modern SSH actually takes that client command, command and puts it in a variable that this command can access. So you've got ways of doing that. I've got, I've got some, some questions about the security of it, so while I know about it, and I have pointed a couple of specific people at it, and I don't want to talk about it publicly until I am better, more you know, versed in thinking that it's, it's still secure. In, in the end, end, it's not in that you're writing a shell script. If you write that menu, if there's, there's a problem with your menu, now you give them the shell access, access right? If, 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 you're, if the command, command you give them is pseudo vim or pseudo emacs, You've, You've given, given them an editor, editor as root. They, they can change any file in your system, uh, and they, they can call out an external shell. shell right? If, if you, you give, give them you know, pseudo uh, send mail, they, they just need to wait a few weeks until they, they have a, uh, they find a root exploit. Right? Right? Give, give them pseudo WordPress, WordPress they need to wait three the hours. They've, they've got an exploit. Right? So um, you've got to be careful what you put in there. That's another reason for not encouraging you know variable commands as much as I can really use them for a couple, couple of different reasons. reasons. Uh, I, I want, want to find, find a better solution. solution. I, I, it's a project, project I stopped working on a year, year and a half ago, and I just haven't got back to it. Ed. On the Bastion House presentation that I did, that was a mention, that was an identified problem. If you give somebody a flexible uh, command that they can get to a shell, you've given them access to the system. Yeah. yeah. If, if you, you give, give them a flexible command where they, they can escape, escape out of it, they, they now, now have a shell in your, on your system. system. Even, Even if they, they didn't, didn't quite, quite you know, officially, officially have an account. account. All, right. All right. Any, Any other uh, questions? questions? No. All right. So you said on that command, uh, using that with R, uh, R sync. So you're having to basically put in the long uh, whatever R sync would normally input into the server. You have to put the exact thing that it's putting. Yeah. And so you, so you can't back up a specific file, you do that very specific backup every single time, no matter what. Actually, in rsync, we can do it. Because okay. rsync spawns a daemon, and then talks, talks to that daemon. So, so for rsync, I can do a command equals whatever the rsync daemon is, and, get, and, and then basically it sets up a private connection to that daemon. If I remember correctly, it's been a little while since I was working on this. So actually, rsync, you can do it, but the, 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 the downside is, now that, that I've given them rsync access, they, they can, can access, access anything, anything that, that I can access, access over RSync, right? 
So, so that, that's, that's the problem. problem. Uh, my, my initial thing I was using that I uh, was trying to do was uh, backup, backup PC, and my goal was to set up a you know little GUI web thingy that, that backup, backup PC has that um, that, that allowed other people to restore their own files. files. The backup, backup PC makes, makes the connection, it calls a command to go through and do a, a file list, makes, makes another uh, calls another command to check the phase of the moon, another one to milk cow, and does, and does a, a dozen different things. So, so I ne ended up needing a dozen different keys with, with command equal, but it, it all does that with one key. key. I didn't have a way of telling backup PC to use multiple things, things and stuff. And then and I came with, 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 with some workarounds, but they, they were really not production worthy. So. Um, anyway, but, but yeah, so you, you, but you run, run into, into now, now I can use it to, to, to back up multiple things with that, that one key, but then somebody that gets that key can, can back up multiple things with that, that one key. key. All right. It sounds like we could potentially push files too. Uh, I imagine there's a flag you can add to say only pull or something. Yeah, yeah. I think for rsync, you have, have to first enable, enable that. that. There's, there's actually a flag, flag you need to send rsync to do this safely. That, that will be in, in my new, new presentation, presentation that I should someday write. Actually, actually, I've written uh, about a third of it. I just need yeah. to turn it into a presentation. It's, it's currently in email, email form helping somebody out. Uh, any, any other, other uh, questions? questions? See, those that heads were back, back taking, taking in too much data or studying or whatever. Glad, glad to see that. that. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks for coming out. out. I, I hope you enjoyed the impromptu uh, tunneling.